I just want to clear something up. I'm not actually a hate-filled, poorly educated, Nazi clown, leftist cancer on humanity. It is true that during a recent CNN news program in which I appeared as a guest expert on democracy and authoritarianism, I did say that in a democracy, it's not acceptable to label your political rivals as treasonous scum simply because they disagree with you on a tax bill. Well, that wise tidbit so enraged a guy named Max that he felt moved to send me an email. Brain, he wrote. All right, I thought. Already this guy thinks I'm smart. I'm going to like this Max guy. But then he continued, you were a hate-filled, poorly educated, Nazi clown, leftist, cancer on humanity. You are evil. Best wishes, <laughs> Max. Did everyone agree with Max, I wondered. So I did what anyone does when they're yearning for thoughtful, considerate, nuanced dialogue presented in a respectful manner. I logged onto my Twitter account. The first tweet was by a guy named Hunky Gay Jesus 12 who wrote, I want to have Brian Kloss's baby. That's better, I thought. <laughs> the second tweet was by a woman who goes by the name of Comment Mama 4000. Enjoyed you on CNN this morning. Hey, this is a reassuring trend. But then she finished. You were a mouth-breathing moron. And so it goes, and so it went. Every time I or anyone else involved in politics says, really, anything. And these days, you don't have to be on TV or on Twitter or even that involved in politics. Increasingly, neighbors stop speaking, friendships end, and families are torn apart by politics. Isn't that true? Do any of us really want to live in that kind of world? I don't. Do we have to live in that kind of world? No, we don't. But we do have to try harder to save ourselves from the political extremism that is tearing our societies apart. We need to defeat political extremism in order to save democracy. But right now, democracy is under threat. Increasingly, lunatics who used to be on the fringes of societies are becoming our leaders. And that which was previously unacceptable is now accepted. If we want to fix this, we're going to have to try harder. We have to try harder because people like Max, people who see those who disagree with them as clowns or cancers, are actually more representative of the history of our species than people who can see those who disagree with them as perhaps incorrect, but still as honest and honorable citizens. That is, we humans are not naturally democratic animals. We're naturally tribal. Democracy isn't hardwired into our brains. Tribalism is. 30,000 years ago, it didn't matter what your views were on tax policy or immigration, because those issues just didn't exist. All that mattered was survival, and survival depended upon protecting people in your tribe from people in another tribe. If strangers from another cave, let's call them Ugg and Zug, came over the ridge of a nearby hill, you wouldn't make them a cup of coffee or offer them a donut and have a chat. If you had, you might have realized that Ugg loved the same prehistoric sports that you do, or that Zug thought that your cave paintings qualified you as the Neanderthal Picasso. But none of that mattered. Our ancestors would grunt and stomp and chase them off with sharp sticks. Sometimes they'd kill them. It was brutal, it was ugly, and it was violent. Eventually, in most of the world, nations replaced tribes. And when powerful nations like England or Spain wanted to build empires, they typically conquered weaker nations using divide and rule tactics. And divided against themselves, those nations splintered and fell. Nations and even empires eventually did learn the survival skill of cooperation, not just within a tribe, but between tribes. We began to build coalitions based on ideas, not just family ties. And citizens solved disagreements with debate and dialogue, not vitriol and violence. That is, democracy happened. And in many places, it flourished. And where it did not flourish, it was at least admired. Unfortunately, nowadays, democracy is not flourishing, 
and formerly model democracies are not admired. Unfortunately, I fear, we have entered a dark age for democracy and a golden age, or perhaps a golden dawn, for political extremism. Unfortunately, I fear, we are creeping backwards toward tribalism. History's monsters knew how to creep us backwards. The first step was to dehumanize a perceived enemy. In the American South, African slaves were sold as stock. Hitler referred to Jews as rats. And some Hutu leaders in Rwanda called Tutsis cockroaches. Those monsters understood that our darkest tribal instincts are not dead. They are only asleep, and they can be awakened. There are monsters in the world now, of course, but what really worries me is how widespread political extremism has become, even in established democracies. The elected leader of my country, the United States, wants to ban Muslims from crossing any border. And on the southern border, he wants to build a big wall, fanning fears, perhaps, that modern-day Uggs and Zugs are coming with sharp sticks. Across Europe, and even here in Greece, the birthplace of democracy, neo-Nazis are being elected. Fringe nutcases are moving mainstream. So why is this happening? Look, nobody is born a political extremist. Toddlers, no matter how badly tempered, don't hate other toddlers. And children sort blocks, not other children by color. Our instinct as a species is to cooperate on some level, but we do learn who to cooperate with. In the 1950s, 5% of Americans said that they would be bothered if their son or daughter married somebody of another political party. Today, that 5% has grown to 50%. Welcome to a new era of political tribalism, an era in which our instinct to be tribal is no longer about family or clan or village, but is about political ideology and political identity. But why is this happening now? Because political extremism grows best when it is nourished by anger, by lies, and by a villain. Anger, perhaps, that my employer moved to Mexico or Malaysia. Anger, perhaps, that the president of the company I've worked for my entire life makes 300 times as much as I do. Or anger, perhaps, at the government for not doing enough to make my life better. Lies, particularly lies that simplify complex problems into a memorable but meaningless soundbite. And nowadays, there are plenty of politicians who are eager to lie to us about who we should blame for our anger. Blame the Muslims. Blame the migrants. Blame the Mexicans. Blame any scapegoat for every disappointment you've ever experienced. When there is anger and lies and villains, compromise and incremental progress are abandoned, replaced by intransigence and sometimes by violence. I'm from the state of Minnesota, in the American Midwest. And for the most part, the state's economy is booming. But if you travel to the northern part of the state, in a region called the Iron Range, it's quite a different story. In the 1950s, the Iron Range was Boomtown, USA, a place where you'd have a good job and a good pension, so long as you worked hard and played by the rules. But today, the Iron Range has rusted left behind by a global economy where iron ore can be made more cheaply in China or India or Brazil. The young people have moved away. There aren't any jobs. And the main streets are dotted with antique shops, food shelves, and bars. Most of the population is elderly and graying, a community nostalgic for a time when opportunity ran as deep as the veins of iron. No meteor struck the Iron Range, it wasn't sacked by Genghis Khan or pillaged by pirates. Ugg and Zug didn't invade from Canada. No, the Iron Range was the victim of global economics. And for people in communities across the globe, from Minnesota to Greece, the global financial crisis was just as devastating as if a meteor, Genghis Khan, pirates, Ugg and Zug all struck at exactly the same time. But who is to blame for the global financial crisis? You can't just grab a sharp stick and attack supply and demand curves. 
but you can search for anyone to pin the blame on. When you feel like you've been screwed, you're a lot more likely to entertain increasingly extreme ideas. That search for blame is like fertilizer to political extremism. There have been many financial crises over the past 200 years, and extremists, particularly right-wing extremists, have thrived in the wake of each. On average, extreme right-wing parties increased their vote share by 30% after a financial crisis. And at the same time that our societies were being ravaged by the invisible hand of economic forces, our societies were also being challenged by rapid demographic change. Ugg and Zug didn't just arrive over a nearby hill. Syrians arrived in Germany, and Somalis had arrived in faraway Minnesota. All of a sudden, everybody in that moment started to return to their tribal mentality, tribes based on ideology and identity. You can see this change every millisecond on Facebook or Twitter or Reddit. Anger, lies, particularly wacky conspiracy theories, and perceived scapegoats and villains. Take Edgar Madison Welch, for example. Edgar was sort of a regular guy who avidly read conspiracy theories online. He read, for example, that Hillary Clinton was running a secret underground child sex ring out of a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C., called, and I swear I'm not making this up, Comet Ping Pong. So Edgar packed up his semi-automatic assault weapon, he drove to Washington, he burst into the restaurant, much to the astonishment of all the families who were happily chomping down on their pepperoni pizzas, and he began firing bullets into the ceiling, thinking that that would somehow release the children that he believed were chained in the basement. When he was arrested, he acknowledged that, quote, the intel on this wasn't 100%. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> but Edgar illustrates a real problem with modern social interactions, online and in person. We're beginning to live in partisan echo chambers. Sometimes it's by choice. Other times, it's because digital algorithms choose for us. But either way, we interact more and more with people who think like us and with those who believe the same things we believe. Unfortunately, a lot of people are also self-selecting into echo chambers that are not just partisan, but extremist, unhinged, and laced with lies. And with social media, anyone in the world can spread false and hateful ideas to everyone else in the world with just the click of a button. And that's why Mark Twain put it best when he wrote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And that's why the greatest challenge for 21st century democracy is that uninformed voters are being replaced, replaced by misinformed voters. Uninformed people often stay home. Misinformed voters turn out, and they often want to blow up the system. And it's also just easier to be misinformed. In a world awash with information and media outlets, it's often easier to just figure out what your political tribe thinks about a given issue and then to parrot that same viewpoint. Look at this chart. In 2016, 75% roughly of Democrats and Republicans in the United States agreed with this statement. Quote, criticism from news organizations stops politicians from doing things they shouldn't. Then Donald Trump ran for and was elected president after a campaign filled with anger with lies and with scapegoats and villains. And virtually overnight, political tribalism split the electorate. Suddenly, the number of Democrats who agreed with the statement went up to 89%, while the number of Republicans who agreed with that same statement went down, way down, to 42%. Americans didn't suddenly just lose faith in the value of a free press in a democratic society. The responses were not ideological. They were tribal. So how do we stop this march toward political tribalism and political extremism? A few years ago, I was doing field research in Tunisia, and I interviewed this man, Saeed Ferjani. 30 years ago, he was a devout Muslim living under a secular dictatorship, and he found the system intolerable. So he plotted a coup d'etat to overthrow the dictator and replace him with an Islamic government. 
When his coup plot was uh, discovered by the dictator, he was arrested and thrown into the darkest basement of the Ministry of the Interior, a building that he told me was, quote, as deep as it is tall, a building in which political prisoners were tortured, hung from their feet with their hands tied behind their backs, nearly drowned in basins of urine and excrement, tied naked to iron rods and left hanging for days like roasted chickens. Frijani was tortured into a coma, and when he came out of it, he realized that the regime had broken his back, but he vowed that they would never break his will. Eventually, he was released, but he was barred from leaving Tunisia. So for the next several months, he taught himself to walk 50 meters at a time without showing the excruciating pain that caused, in the hopes that he would be able to slip by passport control at the Tunis airport without arousing suspicion. And it worked. With a borrowed passport, he escaped to London, where he lived the next 20 years in exile, knowing that if he came back to Tunisia, he would likely be killed. Then, in 2011, the Arab Spring happened. The dictator was toppled and himself forced into exile. Frijani finally went home. Did he seek vengeance when he went back? No. He extended an olive branch. When he became a senior figure in Tunisia's new government, he reconciled with people from the dictator's former regime, even people from the Ministry of the Interior. Partly because of Frijani's ability to overcome his tribal instincts and to reconcile with people who had literally broken his back, Tunisia is the only surviving democracy from the Arab Spring. Frijani realized that democracy cannot survive political extremism, cannot survive the intensifying us-versus-them tribalism, cannot survive the prehistoric mentality that threatened to tear Tunisia apart. So, he helped save his country by ensuring that his intellect overruled his instinct. Democracy over tribalism, compromise over extremism. In the West, we can do the same. We must do the same. If a torture victim can extend an olive branch to people who literally broke his back, then surely we can find it in ourselves to seek common ground with those who disagree with us about tax policy or immigration levels. If we stay tribal, it will be brutal, it will be ugly, and it will be violent. But we don't have to continue down this path. We have something our ancestors did not, the power to vote. Sure, you may be tempted to vote based on anger, based on lies, and based on scapegoating and blame. But we can be better than that. Democracy doesn't occur naturally. It's a choice. A choice to let the better angels of our nature overrule our darkest impulses. It's a choice to reject extremism and embrace pragmatism. It's a choice that we now all must make to save democracy by ensuring that our intellect overrules our instincts. Thank you.